All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about studying the variation in regolith properties um, in the upper one to two meters of the regolith using a combination of uh, mini RF radar data and diviner thermal infrared data. All right, so the lunar south pole is of interest for multiple reasons. Um, first of all, it encompasses part of the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is a very old basin. Um, but it is also partially covered by extended ejecta from Orientale, which is the youngest major basin. Um, it includes Schrodinger Basin, which is a volcanic site um, that's far away from the major mare. And it also contains areas of permanent sunlight um, and is a possible site of future lunar exploration. And so for all these different topics, um, understanding the upper meter of regolith, uh, where the impact uh, material went, um, what the different properties are, um, can help you understand the stratigraphy of the pole um, and how it was built up over time. So I'm going to talk about two specific examples in this talk. And the motivation for the first example that I'm going to talk about really came from prior work that we did using the Arecibo and Green Bank telescopes. Um, and this is some work that was published by Bruce Campbell and Becky Ghent. Um, this uh, radar data over here is actually 70 centimeter wavelength data. The pole is located right here. Um, and this is just a total power image. And this is a circular polarization ratio image. And um, in radar, we use circular polarization ratio as a measure of roughness. So very rough surfaces, like uh, the SP lava flow in Arizona, or rough blocky deposits associated with craters, have very high circular polarization ratios, like around 1 or even over 1. But very uh, smooth surfaces, like just uh, dust-covered surfaces, or um, like pyroclastics, have very low circular polarization ratios. But what uh, Bruce and Becky had realized is that the floors of some of the larger craters across the South Pole, like this is Amundsen over here, uh, Dugalski, and some of the inner crater highlands actually have very high CPR values, up, up to one, uh, or even a little over one. Um, and so they interpreted these as being impact melt deposited by the Orientali Basin forming uh, event. Um, and this kind of forms like a big long finger that stretches across the pole um, uh, from the Orientali an impact. And so one of the things we're interested to do with MINI-RF is look in these areas that you can't see from the Earth and figure out uh, whether any of these cratered highlands also show this high CPR signature. All right, and a brief introduction to the data sets uh, for those of you who might not be familiar. MINI-RF operates at both S-band, 13 centimeter, and C-band wavelengths, and it has a resolution of 15 by 30 meters per pixel. And we use both the total power and circular polarization ratio maps. Um, and diviner is the nine-channel radiometer, which measures both thermal emission and reflected uh, radiation across the moon. And we're going to use the thermal data because uh, that's sensitive to the thermal physical properties, the rock sizes, and things which are similar but complementary to the radar data. Um, and for diviner, we're using the derived maps, including rock abundance and the uh, regular fines temperature um, that Ben Greenhagen talked about and that um, Josh Banfield has been creating. All right, and this is just to show that we have uh, nice mini RF mosaics. Uh, for both poles, we did both east-west or west-looking and east-looking uh, directions with the radar, and that's because the it's useful because the radar uh, is sensitive to topography, and so having the viewing geometry one way, uh, illuminating the surface one way, and then the other way sort of allows you to um, see things that may be related to topography and not to surface properties. But they're pretty nice mosaics. All right, and then so when we looked at this area with mini RF, this is uh, the the picture from Campbell again of the pole, and this is a blow-up of the mosaic, and here's Dugalski again. Um, and you can see when you zoom in close, this high CPR area is really made up of lots of fine pinpoints of craters um, with pretty high CPRs, uh, around one or almost uh, a little less than one in, in the S-band data. Um, but areas here, and then areas uh, of cratered highlands that are um, in the permanent, sh or in the uh, area of radar shadow here, don't have the same uh, uh, number of little points of high CPR. And these are all little impact craters that have thrown up blocky material, um, which we've uh, interpreted and as Bruce is interpreting as, or Bruce and Becky interpreted as being uh, impact craters that penetrated to the melt deposit and kicked up lots of blocks. Um, so sort of the conclusion from this is that this really is kind of a long finger of material uh, from the Oriental impact that goes across the pole. And it doesn't extend um, much farther on the other side. Now for the second example that I want to show. Um, this is getting towards looking at uh, smaller impacts on the moon, um, tens of meter scale impacts. Um, and Becky Gent and Josh have done some work um, comparing radar data to the uh, derived diviner products. Um, this is one particular example that we've been looking at. 
uh, which is Glushko Crater, and it sort of demonstrates that the mini RF data and the, the uh, diviner data show complementary things. So this is the circular polarization overlaid on Clementine, and you can see in the mini RF data, uh, you really pick up the rough crater uh, center and also the impact melt flows out of Glushko. And then you can see this green, uh, these green streaks are the rays of Glushko that you see very clearly in the radar data. But in the rock abundance data, for example, um, it really shows high rock abundance on the interior of the crater and some of the melt flow and uh, proximal ejecta, but you don't actually see uh, the crater rays. Um, and so uh, for crater rays show up very well in all of the radar data. Uh, and you can track Tycho rays across the moon, even as far as like the Apollo 17 landing site, they show up very clearly. Um, but they don't tend to show up in the diviner data. Um, the Tycho rays do show up in the regolith temperature, um, but not in rock abundance. And they're pretty faint, even in the, um, the regolith temperature data. So uh, this is the second example of something interesting that we found at the pole, which is DeForest Crater. Um, looking at this, I noticed that across Schrodinger Basin here, there's these really wispy, uh, fine streaks, which you can trace a little bit back into the highlands. Um, but they show up really well in Schrodinger because this is a very flat area um, in the uh, inner part of the, or outer part of the Schrodinger ring, rather. In CPR, you can see that there's a lot of uh, material close to the crater coming off. And this is probably an oblique impact that came in uh, from the side and spewed material because there's way more uh, rocks, rock uh, populations on this side um, as shown by the radar. Okay. All right, so here's some other examples just uh, showing um, that this is not particularly visible to other data sources. Um, in some places, this is another mini RF uh, image, which is zoomed in uh, here. This is a Clementine image of Schrodinger Basin. And so this is the part of the air, uh, where the uh, uh, ray crosses over in the radar. And you can see in the radar data, there's a very uh, well-defined difference between these areas that have the streaky material and the other flat areas um, of Schrodinger Basin. And there's no uh, corresponding albedo change in the Clementine data. Um, and this is a pretty nice geologic map created by Scott Mest, um, where he used post-Apollo data to redo the mapping. Um, and he has a couple different units here in the south, one of which, um, this dark green one, uh, he had interpreted to be as crater ejecta uh, from impacts outside the basin. But the crater array crosses over both of these units. And so that's another example of the fact that there's not a, a surface expression of this that's really uh, visible um, in optical data sources. Um, or, or other data sources that people had, had typically uh, looked at. Um, the crater ray does get more diffuse as you go out here, and it sort of blends in more with the, the surroundings. But in places, um, it's just really well defined. And it also does correspond to higher circular polarization ratios um, across, across this area. So we wanted to look uh, also in diviner data, because if the crater ray materials were close to the surface, within a few centimeters, um, you might expect that they would create a thermal signature similar to what you see with the Tycho rays. And so we looked at both the rock abundance um, and this is the regolith temperature map um, created by Josh. And there's nothing in the rock abundance data, which um, I guess is not surprising because that doesn't tend to show crater rays. Um, and there's also nothing, uh, no signature that corresponds to any of the crater rays um, uh, here either. Um, so this, I uh, apologize, this is upside down and somehow the arrows have gotten migrated. But this is the area where the, uh, you see the crater area really clearly in the radar data. Um, but there's no corresponding signature uh, in the regolith temperature. Um, however, if the rocks from the ray were really in the upper couple centimeters, um, you might expect to see them in this. So that's sort of bracketing where you might expect that this material has been buried. Um, the radar data at S-band can only see down um, probably at most one and a half meters. And so what you're looking at is materials from the impact that are probably within the upper meter, but buried lower than just a few centimeters. All right. So in summary, um, the high CPR areas that we saw in the ground-based radar um, as a streak from oriental impact melt sort of going across the pole, um, they're really made up of an abundance of small high CPR little craters, uh, which have thrown out blocky material. Um, and they don't extend significantly on the far side um, that we hadn't been able to image before. And DeForest Crater appears to have a ray that's extending across the southern side of Schrodinger Basin. Um, the ray is not visible to Diviner, and it's not clearly visible in optical data either. Um, and it's likely, therefore, buried under tens of centimeters of material. And finally, I just wanted to talk briefly about um, why I think this is re a really useful um, thing. 
that relic ray structures and impact melts um, are more visible in radar often than they are in optical data, and you actually do see through a couple centimeters worth of material to be able to track this stuff. Um, and Cassie Wells, who's a grad student at Cornell, um, has done some good work um, looking at uh, the Tycho rays and how far away they extend um, um, from Tycho, and actually being able to use that to trace what secondary crater, what things are secondary craters and what things are primary craters, because the rays show up so well that you can associate them um, with specific secondary craters um, and be able to know where those secondary craters came from. And this is the same thing with the de uh, deforest ray that you can tell uh, when you look in LROC imagery and you can see all the little secondary craters laid out along that edge of Schrodinger Basin, um, that those are uh, all related to deforest and you can kind of trace them back. Um, um, and then also the fact that the radar does see it under the surface and is able to track these things out, I think it's a really good resource. Um, I'm not an expert in crater modeling or crater physics, um, but some of these things, when we look at them at the radar, really uh, do sort of look like um, modeling or gun experiments done by Pete Schultz and things like that. So I think there's a lot to be learned in looking at these things that are oblique impacts and where the impact materials go um, and how they get buried with time. So, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, how, how old do we think the DeForest crater is? Is it a fairly fresh crater, or is it maybe billions of years old? Um, it's older than Tycho, but it's, uh, the rim is pretty well preserved, so it's not a really old crater either. Um, I don't know what the, uh, what the age dating is thought to be on that, actually. OK. Just because if, it, if it's buried, uh, so what does that mean? Does that mean the ray has been sort of chewed up and, and regularly been processed, or has something else happened as well? Um, yeah, I would say that both has been chewed up or maybe other material from other impacts has been deposited on top of it. And the ray materials are probably really small that the radar is seeing, like a few centimeter particles that are showing up as the rough, the rough surface. Um, so if you have very small rocks, it might be easy for them to get covered over by material from subsequent impacts or broken up by micrometeorites. Um, OK. This is really nice work. Uh, I was thinking as you were talking, is, is there, and this may be further down the road for you, um, to what extent can you quantify these relationships? Um, and what I'm thinking of is, is developing a relative scale for some of these impact craters and their rays in particular. Is that something that's viable? And if so, when might be, you be able to do that? <laughs> Um, so do you mean in terms of uh, the size of the crater versus the, the, the length of the, cr the crater rays and the impact ejecta, or do you mean in terms of understanding the rock populations? Well, I'm actually thinking in terms of a, something similar to what Bill was getting at, is a relative dating of yes. some of these features. Yes, that is really interesting, and um, something that we've um, talked a lot, especially with Cassie and, and her work with Tycho, is that um, you know, if you can get some handle using a combination of the infrared and radar data as to where those yeah. things are located in the yeah. surface, then that would tell you how much regolith are, might have been deposited on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's definitely something that we're working towards. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you.